Hi! So, the purpose of this video, other than showing off my track hoodie from a long time ago, is to summarize what we've learned about Athens and Sparta and the economic, political, and social systems in those two cities. So, Athens and Sparta are both examples of city-states, right? And they're very different. And the point of studying the two of them is to study the contrast. Athens is the most famous city-state, and most of the time when people talk about ancient Greece, they're talking about ancient Athens. When people talk about Socrates and Aeschylus and Eratosthenes and all these dudes who like did really cool things, most of those guys lived in Greece, with some exceptions of like Archimedes and Thales and some other dudes. But blah, blah, blah. The economic system, the political system, and social system in Greece are really different from the economic, political, and social system in Sparta. As you learned on Thursday, Sparta was really focused on one thing. And if Sparta did anything well, it was building their whole culture, their whole civilization around the idea of producing a powerful army with strong warriors that together can conquer almost any, almost any army. Okay, they were vast outnumbered at Thermopylae, at a lot of places, and were able to defeat their enemies, mostly because they were just really effective. They lost in the end, and Sparta really didn't persist as an empire much beyond the 4th century BCE, but for a while they were they were the coolest. Okay, um, By coolest I mean people were scared of them and worried of what the Spartans might choose to do. They controlled the Peloponnese, the Peloponnesian Peninsula, and they had considerable resources for waging war. Um, the Athenians started a war with them, but it was with the understanding that they could fight it on sea, at least in part. They didn't really try to attack them on land, because they knew they would lose. So, Sparta. We're going to start with what we know about their political system. Okay, They had two kings. Why? So that one could go fight and one could stay home and rule, mostly. And then if one of them died, then the other one could help get another one. And that would also decentralize power. And they knew people were going to die. So you don't want just one guy, you want two. Why not? You also had a ruling council of 28 others, a total of 30 men, it was all men, and they had to be warriors who were at least 60. So they got together and made decisions. It, well, the king had really final say over most things, but it was not about a democracy in the Athenian sense. It was more about wise old men who can get together and talk about things and help the king make a decision. So if the king was on the battlefield and made a decision, it wasn't like the council would be like, no, no, we don't agree with you, we're going to overrule you. Although they didn't always have to get along. But that was their political system. Okay, so there's no women, there's no voting, other than inside that council. And there's no, like, term limits or anything. So um, you get in there by being a warrior, and yeah. The political system in Athens was different. And the history gets complicated between Athens and Sparta, because Sparta messed with Athens a little bit. In at least one case, they helped cause major changes. So Athens was an oligarchy ruled by a few for a long time, like from when it was established until the middle of the 6th century. And then a dude rode into town and took over, and he, uh, Pisistratus, and he was okay. Uh, he became what's called a tyrant, like a dictator. And as long as he was semi-fair, then people didn't seem to mind. It was only when another guy took over with help from the Spartans that people got mad. Uh, so, um... Hippias, I believe, was the dude who took over with help from the Spartans. But people were so annoyed that the Spartans had gotten involved and the Spartans stayed to help prop up this guy and keep him in power and sort of like guard him as like bodyguards that they picked up whatever weapons they could and they chased him onto the Acropolis, the big 
hill in the middle of the city and they force them to surrender. So in about 510, 509 BCE, Athens became a democracy because of a revolution. So sort of like the United States, they were under control of an evil ruler and they, the people said, this sucks, so let's do something. And they did, and they made it a democracy. They went to a dude named Cleisthenes and asked, bro, we need to make this government work for the people. Help us. And he did. He helped turn Athens into a democracy. He's the one who came up with the idea of voting with pebbles so that you had, and if you saw this in the video, this is me repeating the video, uh, you had all of the white, all of the native-born Athenians on a hill, no slaves, no women, no foreigners, no kids, and you gave everybody like a choice of rocks and you said, should we go to war with Sparta or should we raise taxes or should we make it illegal to um, give your slave freedom or a raise or whatever law or whatever they were trying to do. And then the Athenian men would pick up uh, a black pebble if they wanted to vote no or a white pebble if they wanted to vote yes and then would drop it in a, a bucket or a, a pot and then somebody would count up the pebbles and that's how you voted. Uh, this happened about every nine days then we get together and vote on laws. There were some people who were picked to go be part of the gover government every day and those people met every day to talk about what laws they wanted. And, um, after nine days then everybody had to get together to vote. You couldn't pass a law without everybody voting. You didn't really elect a representative the way that we elect a representative now. There was a mix of uh, the people making the rules and the people voting, but nothing important could happen without everybody voting. And every nine days is a lot different from every four years or two years. So it was a direct democracy. And it worked for a while. It worked when a dude named Pericles came along and he was able to help direct people's votes where he could stand up and talk and make people change their mind or vote in a certain way to make Athens a great place. Pericles had a lot of big ideas and big hopes and dreams for Athens and he helped make them real. After they won against the Persians at Salamis, the Athenians had a big powerful navy they were able to go trade with everybody and trade made them rich and because they were rich and they had this money and this big powerful navy all of a sudden Athens was a cool place and Athens had money to support people like um, Herodotus and Aeschylus and all of these other famous scientists and artists and writers who helped change Athens into like a good place to live for the rich people. Uh, there were some happy accidents too, like they found a big pile of silver, well, not a pile, but they found some silver and that was able to, have, able to help them pay for their navy and all that kind of stuff. It was at this time that they built the Parthenon, which is still there. It's a really famous building in the middle of Athens, a giant temple to Athena, which is what Athens is named after. Um, so their political system was kind of unique, and when Pericles died, in 429 from disease, from plague, their political system became a problem because they didn't have a leader who could help people make a good decision. And when it comes down to a popular vote versus like uh, a principled leader, then popular vote can go really wrong. If you have some guy who shows up and says, bro, uh, I want you to vote for this because then we can all have free ice cream. And everyone says, ooh, free ice cream. Uh, and they vote for it just because they can get free ice cream. It doesn't really work out so good in the end because everybody eats too much ice cream and nobody remembers what they were voting for or why. So you ended up with a weak city-state 
one of the last things Pericles did was declare war on the Spartans, a war they would finally lose after a long, difficult war. And Athens after that was not anywhere special, unfortunately. So for about 30 years, Athens was like this amazing place, and then it was not. And that was a big part of the political system. So I think you, you're seeing a big difference in the political system, but you're starting to see the effects on the economic and the social. So let's go back to Sparta for a second. So the social system in Sparta is really about being a good warrior. So you have the, the ruling class or the warriors. They don't really have like the rich people. They don't have like the uh, rich old families. I mean, they have the warriors who won stuff and people respect, but they don't have like uh, a famous uh, rich old family that everybody like thinks deserves all their respect because they're really rich. So you have famous warriors and you have people who are known for their leadership and then you have everybody else. And it's not a complicated social structure. You have the warrior class, who are also the ruling class, and then you have the slaves, which are called the helots, uh, and then you have uh, everybody else. The um, periochi, I forget their name, uh, the farmers and the regular people. I'm sorry, not the farmers, the craftsmen people and the regular people. So they don't necessarily have to interact too much. The warriors go and fight and everybody else sort of does their thing. Uh, money, for example, well, we're talking about social, but the money is interesting because they have these giant iron, iron bars for money. So like if you wanted to buy something with money, you had to carry around these heavy iron bars. They did it that way because they thought it'd be hard to steal. It never occurred to them that somebody would have like a closet full of iron bars and try to hide them and be rich the way that people in Greece might have, like a treasure room or a, a place where they keep all their, their money. Um, so yeah. Uh, so economic system, Athens was a huge trading port. They were right next to the Mediterranean. They had their own little port right next to Athens and they had a walls around the road to it. It was only a few miles away, so they weren't right next to the ocean so that storms or the sea so that the storms couldn't wreck them, but they also were close enough where they could like put stuff on a cart and wheel it into Athens. Uh, their big navy made them really powerful uh, uh, on the ocean, so no one on the sea, so no one wanted to challenge them for trade. And they could go to places like Syria or Alexandria and Egypt or Carthage or to the Phoenicians. They could go anywhere. They had all kinds of stuff coming in from all over the place. They were uh, a rich trading city. Uh, this also brought in all kinds of language and money from other places and ideas, and it was uh, a big benefit to Athens to be open like that. Sparta did not believe in trade. They did not believe that they should do that. If they needed something, they didn't put somebody in a boat and send them to go trade for it. They sent their army to go take over somebody else and make them do it for them or steal it or whatever. So the economy of Athens was much more diverse and accepting and strong. The economy of Sparta was about taking over and conquest and slaves. They had a lot of slaves in Athens, don't get me wrong, but Athens also had a lot of outsiders who could come in and become important. You couldn't vote if you were from somewhere else, but you could hang out with people like Herodotus who invented history. Or you could watch the plays of Aeschylus and say, I'm going to go back and try this in my home country. So Athens had a lot of benefits from being open, and Sparta... Uh, they were strong. That was their thing. So, to summarize, Athens was an open culture for the most part. They let outsiders in. They traded a lot. They benefited a lot financially and in terms of like having different types of ideas and food 
and prosperity from this openness. Sparta was much more closed, much more aggressively, I want to say colonial. They would go out and take things if they needed something. They didn't think they had to, had to trade for it when they had a powerful army. That's why they had a powerful army, right? Um, the class structure and the social structure in Athens was a lot more complicated because you had so many different groups of people. Uh, it was a lot simpler in Sparta. Uh, Athens had democracy. Sparta never did. And um, Sparta, in the end, sort of won, but not for long, when they finally fought against each other in the Peloponnesian War. Uh, to sum up, and to look to the end here, these two city-states didn't get along, and Athens started a war with Sparta because they wanted to take over all of the Greek island, all of the Greek peninsula. They eventually lost because they didn't have good leaders after Pericles died. And then, uh, really quickly, Sparta, well, not really quickly, but after Sparta beat them, uh, the Thebans, the city of Thebes, took over both Athens and Sparta. And then Philip of Macedon, the Macedonians, swept in and took over everything. They were so weak from trying to fight each other that they couldn't defend themselves against an outside invader. And right after they were conquered, then uh, Alexander the Great said, let's, let's go take over the world. Interestingly, he went east, not west. Alexander the Great is an important guy who conquered most of the known world from Greece east. There were these dudes hanging out in Italy who had just started their culture right around the time when Alexander was taken off. If he'd gone the other way, then I think the world would be a lot different. But Alexander went this way and attacked the Persians and beat them and then kept going. So he took over the Persian Empire and then he went all the way to India. So um, he brought with him his love of Greece and Greek culture. And he brought what he learned from his buddy Aristotle, who was an Athenian, who he learned under Plato, who he learned from Socrates. So the importance of this later came mostly from that dude, uh, Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great is who took Greek ideas and spread them around and made them part of his empire. And he, want, he encouraged people to learn Greek and named a bunch of cities after himself. And there were all these books and important ideas that were spread around because of Greek language and learning. And Greek books in the library in Alexandria and Egypt and throughout the Middle East that helped Greek culture survive through what some people call the Dark Ages. So the Romans came along and they wanted everyone to think everything was awesome because of them and they copied a lot of Greek ideas and they translated a lot of Greek stuff into Latin, which is the Roman language. And then they got taken over and trashed by all kinds of the Visigoths and the Huns and all kinds of other tribes and a lot of their culture got destroyed, burned to the ground and it was gone except for what had survived because of Alexander the Great in places like Baghdad or Alexandria in Egypt. So that eventually became the Renaissance when people realized that the ancient Athenians were sitting around thinking about how big the earth was or uh, the Pythagorean theorem, or that dude Archimedes um, about principles of leverage and how things float and all those fun things that we're going to talk about in physics that people still use. So these Greek guys were really smart and all of a sudden everyone was like, hey, Greek culture is worth learning, so let's all learn Greek. So it became popular for rich and powerful people in the Middle Ages to try to learn Latin and Greek so that they could read ancient Greek writings because of what dudes are writing in Athens. 
So blah, blah, blah. The important thing is, I think I've said that four times now, is that a lot of Greek ideas ended up in Rome and ended up shaping how Rome turned out. Democracy was a Greek idea that failed in Athens. The Romans tried it. It failed in Rome, ultimately, because of the emperors. And then we tried it. And we're one of the few who went with a direct or went with a representative democracy. A lot of places have a parliamentary system unlike ours. But our government is based on ideas that started in Greece, in Athens, and came to us through the Romans. And I guess that's about it. We really need to come back and talk about the political system some more, and then we're going to move on to the Romans. Peace out.